services of the Schrader Lane Church of Christ. We're really happy that you're here with us today and that you've chosen to join us this morning. We look forward to a time of soul-nourishing and reinvigorating worship and praise to our Lord Jesus Christ. I have just a few announcements to make before we get into our worship, and you can see a more detailed uh, uh, list of announcements in the July edition of the Schrader Lane Connector, which you can access via our web page. Uh, please pray for the family of one of our elders, uh, Jimmy Phillips. A number of family members in multiple generations are experiencing a variety of health-related uh, concerns and issues, and they just ask you to keep us, to keep them in your prayers. Uh, and please pray for all of those who have lost loved ones recently. There are many people who are grieving, uh, and still the losses of loved ones is a little bit more difficult to do. When we're not together so please keep them in your, uh, your prayers on thursday july 9th there will be a free legal clinic uh, conducted via zoom uh, beginning at 7 30 p.m uh, here at the church uh, attorney uh, susan tucker jones one of our active members and her colleagues will be available uh, for legal consultation and referral also uh, the meharry medical college will conduct COVID-19 testing here at the Strader Lane Church of Christ in the east uh, parking lot on July 18th from 9 to 1. Uh, testing is free and anyone who would like to be tested is welcome. Also on July 18th, that same day, there will be a drive-through pickup for communion supplies and masks here in the west parking lot uh, between the hours of 10.30 and 12.30. And several of our ministries, uh, ladies in our ministries, have uh, 
have uh, uh, sewn these masks and uh, they will be available free to, uh, to, to the members of the church. And although we have evaluated plans and processes for physical gathering, the continued danger of the coronavirus makes it impractical for us to do so at this time. So please know that your leaders are prayerfully planning with uh, spiritual wisdom and guidance to keep us well connected and the practical wisdom to keep us healthy. So please be patient as we uh, continue to uh, worship apart even though we're connected together in spirit and in, uh, in our hearts. And please continue to practice social distancing, frequent hand washing, and the wearing of masks when in public places and groups of greater than 10. And as Christians, please continue to pray for God's uh, guidance and blessings as we navigate uh, this uh, pandemic. Let's go to our Father in prayer. Our God and Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the blessed opportunity that we have today to come and worship you, to remember how great and powerful and wonderful you are, to worship your son, Jesus Christ, and to thank him for his death and burial and resurrection. Lord, we thank you so much for the ways that you have blessed us through these difficult times, for how you have helped us to keep our hearts and our minds focused on you. And we pray that as we go forward that we will continue to look to you for your guidance, and we pray for your mercy and for your grace, and that you would help us, Lord, to be men and women who really seek and uh, search for you and the answers that we uh, seek in our lives. God, we love you, we thank you, we honor you, we praise you, and again, we're grateful to be able to be together this morning. We ask these in all prayers in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Only you are holy, for well, there's no one else like you. Only you are holy. church say amen again amen. for we know that he is holy and he is worthy that is why our next selection says that every praise is to our God as we stand join with me as we sing every praise is to our God every word of worship with one accord every praise
come to a portion of service where we have an opportunity to give back a portion of that which God has blessed us with. We see the pattern in giving uh, in the scripture that Paul wrote to the Corinthians in the first Corinthians chapter 16 in verse 2, we see the pattern of when we are to give. On the first day of the week, we set aside that uh, portion of that which says God has prospered us. We also see the pattern on how to give in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 through 8, which talks about God expects us and it loves a cheerful giver. Someone gives without compulsion. Someone who gives out of a clear and pure heart. With these two things in mind, let us pray and let us give. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Father, for giving us the opportunity to come together once again. Whether we be here physically, Lord, or be here virtually, Lord, we thank you, Father, for allowing us to gather in your name and call on your name once again. Once again, Father, because that is a blessing all in itself, that you allow us to call on your name. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would bless this offering that is being given in purpose right now, Father. Bless this offering that is being purpose right now in your name, Father, that it might go towards your work, that it may expand your kingdom, that it may do your will. We thank you, Father, for all these things. We thank you, Father, for this ability. We thank you, Father, for this, this glorious opportunity to be called your child. We thank you, Father, for all these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Likewise, we have an opportunity today to celebrate the communion where we remember the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We have a pattern of when to do this in Acts chapter 20 and verse 7 when it says the disciples came together to break bread on the first day of the week. We have a pattern on how to do it in 1 Corinthians 11, beginning in verse 23, where we know that we take the unleavened bread as a representation of the body given in sacrifice for our sins, and the fruit of the vine that was spilled as blood for the remission of our sins. We thank you, Father, for giving these things, and we take this time to remember the death, burial, and the glorious resurrection Amen. of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let us pray for the fruit and for the bread. Father, in the name of Jesus, once again, we come before your throne of grace, O oh Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Father, for the sacrifice that you made such a long time ago. Thank you for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you, O oh Lord, for the body that was given, that was hung on the cross and pierced such a long time ago, Lord. Thank you, Father, for the blood that was spilled for remission of our sins, O oh Lord, for you had no sin. Thank you, Father, for washing us clean and giving us the opportunity to come before your throne of grace, Father, to fall on our knees, O oh Lord, and to praise your name. We thank you, Father, for all these things. As we take this bread, please bless this bread. As we take this fruit of vine, please bless this fruit and bless all the hearts and minds that call on your name this day, Father. We thank you, Father, for all these things. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm so glad you died for me.
so glad. I'm so glad you died for me. And I'm so glad you shed your blood for me.
Say amen. 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 I'm just delighted to be here on this morning. And as we praise God and lift our voices to him and are reminded that God is awesome, for us to be able to gather today on the first day of the week without regard to the maladies that surround us, particularly with the coronavirus, we know that God is blessing us. He is awesome. It's a joy to be here. It's a privilege to be here on the first day of the week and to know that you are participating in worshiping God genuinely in spirit and in truth. Thank you for your presence here today. Those of you who are physically present and those of you who are present by means of technology. Our thanks to Brother Turner for getting us started well this morning. Thank you, Brother Booker and our ensemble for bringing us those beautiful songs. And again, I want to encourage those of us who are worshiping at home to join in and sing, not to watch, but to participate as we enjoy the worship service today. I want to thank Jaden Blair, a young man who just graduated from high school for being with us today and reading the scripture and Jonathan Pinkerton, who so aptly came to us today to officiate over the offering and the communion. Yeah. It's a privilege, as I've said, to be here today. We know that 244 years ago, Thomas Jefferson and his cohorts wrote refined and penned the Declaration of Independence. In its preamble, the statement was made, and it is often quoted, that we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and among these, and he goes on to give us such words that are, are powerful. Life. Life is so important. And it is a right. And when we think about the pursuit of happiness, we realize that it's a freedom and an independence that we all seek. And liberty is something for which we long. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness Although this country, the United States of America, with those words solidified a commitment to independence against the tyranny of Great Britain, it is long, long before that that our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, came to this earth, died for our sins, and in doing so, provided for us the blessings of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And if that were not enough, he has given us the blessing of eternal life. So today, as I stand before us on this Independence Weekend, I want to declare and encourage you that our Daily dependence is, in fact, our real independence. Our independence is not an element or a right within itself, but you and I have independence, particularly in our spiritual walk, as we acknowledge, recall, observe our dependence. In today's lesson, <laughs> I would like to emphasize that we are, in fact, dependent upon Christ. We are not, and never shall we long for independence from Christ. We are dependent upon truth, as the passage that we shall read again emphasize. We are dependent upon the Holy Spirit, the paraclete, the comforter, the guide, we are, in fact, dependent upon one another. 
And by all means, no liberty would be ours apart from our dependence upon our God. Our dependence upon Christ, as we read from the 8th chapter of the Gospel of John, this particular setting comes at a time when Christ was doing miraculous things and Christ was teaching and the Pharisees and various scribes and religious groups were questioning his authority as the Son of God. In the passage, it's described to us that Jesus healed a woman, John chapter 8. Rather, he forgave a woman who was set before him, the Bible tells us in verse 3 of John chapter 8. The scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery, and when they had set her in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. And then their question was, Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what do you say? You see, this was another failed and flawed attempt to catch Jesus and to have him say something inconsistent with the law so that the mass of people would be against him or for him to agree with the law so that ultimately they would say that since what he says agrees with the law, then there's no reason for his authority because he was claiming to be the Son of God the one who brought forth the new covenant. This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said to them, He that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone. And I want you to see what happened. And they which heard it, being convicted of their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said, Woman, where are thou accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? And she said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. I emphasize that our liberty today is in Christ. It was Patrick Henry who said those words in 1775, give me liberty or give me death. Jesus has given us liberty. In Galatians chapter 5 verse 1, the Bible tells us to stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. Christ has given us liberty and he has done so in his death. Jesus said, neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. So it's in this context then that we read beginning with verse 31, then said Jesus unto those Jews which believed on him, if you continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Our independence is a direct result of our dependence on Christ 
because Christ gives us freedom from the law of Moses and from sin. The emphasis in this particular part of the passage has to do with sin, but notice verse 33 of John chapter 8. They answered him, we are Abraham's seed and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Why is it, Jesus, that you're telling us that we should know your truth and the truth will make us free. We're Abraham's seed. We have not been slaves. So why are you telling us that we'll be made free? So Jesus describes the scenario by saying, truly, verse 34, verily I say unto you, whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. You see, when we sin, we are not free. Christ says we are the servants of sin. And he goes on to say in verse 37, or verse 36, If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. So I just want to recognize that the independence that we claim, that we enjoy, that is life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and yes, eternal life, are dependent upon Christ. We are dependent upon him. We depend on him for forgiveness, just as the adulterous woman did here in the 8th chapter, verses 1 through 11. We depend on him for righteousness. <clears throat> in Galatians chapter 2, and the verse is 21, the scripture here is helping us to appreciate that our righteousness is not attained through the law of Moses. Galatians 2 verse 21 says, If righteousness is by law, then Christ is dead in vain. So you and I today are dependent upon Christ for righteousness, that is, for being made right before God, for being justified in spite of our sinfulness. Righteousness is something for which we are dependent upon God. Intercession. You and I lack the ability to come before God with all that we need to say. We don't even know what we need to say to God. But in Romans chapter 8, in the verses 34, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> the scripture emphasizes that Christ is at the right hand of God interceding for us. You see, interceding for us is not just interpreting our prayers, as it says in verse 26 about the Holy Spirit, but Christ is speaking on our behalf before God. He intercedes. We are dependent upon him. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 25 emphasizes the same. We are dependent upon Christ for cleansing. In the world in which we live, we are often eager to point out the flaws, the sins, the maladies, the mistakes of others, but don't you know that we need cleansing? Each one of us stands indebted to Christ for cleansing. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, the Bible tells us that if we'll confess our sins, our, our, our Savior not only will forgive us, but will cleanse us from our unrighteousness. We are dependent upon Christ. Not only are we dependent upon Christ, but in the passage, as we read here in John chapter 8, we see that we are dependent upon truth. <clears throat> Allow me to emphasize the necessity for the truth. Christ said it well in verse 32, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. It's not 
war that makes us free. It's not the Declaration of Independence that makes us free. But as free moral agents, those of us who have the capacity, we have been given by God the ability to choose to do right or to do wrong, we must be guided, and the guide that Christ has left for us is truth. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. You may ask the question, from what does truth free us? And I want to emphasize more than anything else, briefly, that truth frees us from sin. How does that work? Well, in John chapter 17, and the verse is 17, as Jesus prayed to his heavenly Father, he says, Father, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Truth the truth specifically of God's word sanctifies us. It sets us apart. It separates us from the conditions, that is, from being adherence to the conditions of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. There are those of us today who have beliefs, particularly religious beliefs, that are based on emotion, that are based on feeling. Not too long ago, just two weeks ago, I was working in my lawn, and a gentleman, an acquaintance, saw me there, and he stopped, and he pulled in to the lawn, and uh, without regard to the work I was trying to do in the small time I had to do it, he began a conversation with and in the conversation, he emphasized that, Robert, you're a preacher, and what you need to be doing is preaching the truth. But the truth that he had in mind wasn't the truth at all. I'll give you an example. His emotional unrest, particularly as we all saw and see and feel the injustices associated with the murder of Mr. Floyd. He says, Robert, you have to tell people that the gospel was made up by white people. That was his idea of truth. And because of that, and he went on to, to tell me, and I, I listened with both interest and disgust. But he went on to tell me why he believed that, and all his beliefs were based on emotion, fear, anger, and there may have even been a little bit of hatred in there, and racism from the perspective of the oppressed and not only that of the oppressor. What we have to understand, brothers and sisters, is that truth sanctifies us. It sets us apart and you and I are freed from sin by truth. As I listen and at the same time going to get back to my yard work in the limited time that I had, the question that I posed was, if you are right, then that's amazing. It's different, but I believe in God's word. If you are wrong and you do not obey and follow God's word, that's tragic because you will be lost. God's word, truth, sanctifies us. It sets us apart. And it saves us from sin. It sets us free. In Romans chapter 6, and I ask you to open your Bibles, especially those of you who are, are at home, please open your Bibles. Romans chapter 6 is amazing because it tells us that, yes, 
truth sets us free. In, in verse 1 of Romans chapter 6, after giving a discourse regarding the grace that we have in Jesus Christ, he says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. You see, the debate was, if grace, if the grace that comes under Christ is beneficial and provides for us, procures our salvation, then why do we need to live righteously because we simply depend on grace? Paul says, no. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. No. You and I must recognize that we are set free from sin. I want you to see this. And those of you who are struggling, and perhaps you have not yet announced it, but you are struggling with the realization that we are set free from sin by Christ Jesus. I want you to see how Paul teaches this so eloquently. Verse 3, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into death. This is the gospel. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. He, in two short sentences, gives us the essence of the gospel, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, not only that, but when you get to verse 7, for he that is dead is free from sin. You see, Christ was sinless, and when we die with him through baptism and die to sin, we are free from sin, free from the habitual practice of sin. There is no religion. There is no dogma. There is no doctrine that will do that. It's only by the blood of Christ that we are free from sin. And truth does this. Throughout this passage, verse 7, free from sin. Verse 18, made free from sin. Verse 22, made free from sin. You and I are made free from sin by the truth. We have salvation by the truth. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. You and I are familiar with the gospel in uh, Romans chapter 16, verse 15. The apostle Paul said, As much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to those who are at Rome also. And then in verse 16, he said, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. We're talking about the truth. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also the Greek. Brothers and sisters, our freedom from sin comes by knowing, by hearing, by believing the truth of God's word. Never become so independent that we refuse or fail to depend on God's word. And then there's the Holy Spirit. You and I are dependent upon the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 14, verses 15 through 17 particularly, we know that Christ declared that he would go away, but he would not leave us comfortless. He would give us a comforter, a paraclete, and that is the Holy Spirit. In this writing, Jesus made it clear to us that you and I need and should depend upon this comforter. If you love me, keep 
my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth. There's that word again. The Holy Spirit being one with God the Father and one with God the Son is the spirit of truth. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. And he goes on to describe, you and I are dependent upon the comforter and he is our guide. John chapter 16, verse 3, the Holy Spirit guides us in truth. He is our intercessor, the one who intercedes for us, Romans chapter 8, verse 26. So you and I are dependent upon the Holy Spirit. So we are dependent upon Christ, we are dependent upon truth, we are dependent upon the Holy Spirit, and brothers and sisters, shall we never, ever become so self-sufficient that we fail to realize our dependence upon one another. I often am disappointed to be candid at the frequency with which those of us who are children of God fail to cherish the dependence that we have one upon the other. How is it that we can so easily malign one the other? How is it that we can undermine our brothers and our sisters? How is it that those of us who are children of God can have such enormous issues with others who are children of God that we fail to realize and act? in accord to our mutual dependence. You and I have dependence upon one another. In Romans chapter 13, one of the more than 50 passages that I like to call one another passages, the Bible teaches us to love one another. And of all the things that you may owe someone, notice how this reads. Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Brothers and sisters, there is no higher calling for the children of God beyond loving God than loving one another. As we shared on last Sunday night, yes, we are to love our Heavenly Father. We are to honor, we are to worship God. That's the first and greatest commandment, but right behind that is the second, and that's to love one another. We are dependent upon one another. We're dependent upon one another for kindness, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, the Bible emphasizes that we are to be kindly affectioned one to the other. It's a challenge. Please listen carefully. It is a challenge sometimes for those of us who are brothers and sisters in the family of God to demonstrate that we are kindly affection one toward the other. It's our responsibility. We are dependent upon one another. I am dependent upon you to love me. And you may not realize it, but you are dependent upon me to love you. When we love one another, God blesses us enormously. We have the peace of mind. We have the continuity of being with one another before God. In, in the writing of 1 John, Christ says, how can you say, John says, how can you say that you love God and hate your brother? We're dependent upon one another. We're dependent upon one another for forgiveness as well. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. We are dependent upon one another for mercy. Matthew chapter 5, 
verse 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. We're dependent upon one another for mercy. Are you merciful to your fellow man? We're dependent upon one another for burden bearing. You know, the Second Amendment is the right to bear arms. But God has given us something better to bear. We are to bear one another's burdens. Again, Galatians chapter 6, 2. We are dependent upon one another. As our elder brother Turner today shared with us our collective prayers for those who have death in their families. And I want to continue to hold up to you those family, those church, those brothers and sisters who have such pain and, and agony that we together bear one another's burdens. We're dependent upon one another for prayer. In Ephesians chapter 6, and the verse is 18, you and I are to pray. We are to pray continuously. We are to pray ardently. We are to pray fervently. We are to pray without ceasing. My day is dependent upon God. It is dependent upon Christ. It is dependent upon truth. It is dependent upon the Holy Spirit, but my daily dependence is upon you. We are dependent upon one another, and I love it. You all don't know how much I love it. You don't know how much I appreciate it when you say to me, Brother Gardenhire, I pray for you. I like to say to our elders, and one of them being with us today, Dr. Turner, I like to say, Dr. Turner, I pray for you. I pray for our elders. I like to say to our deacons, I pray for our deacons. And I love it when I hear you say, I pray for you. I like to know that when someone's sister passes away or someone's brother passes away or someone's daughter passes away, regardless of the circumstances, that the family of God, dependent upon one another as we are, are praying for one another. There are some days, brothers and sisters, when I don't know if I can make it through without your prayers. Quite often, when we have members who are dealing with distress, I, I talked with a dear sister, Hattie Burns, recently, as she was hospitalized and being given the prognosis from the physicians. I said, Hattie, we're praying for you. And from her hospital bed, she says, and I feel the prayers. That's what we're talking about. Our dependency upon one another is so great that even in our times of greatest fear and doubt, we ought to be able to feel one another's prayers. And finally, brothers and sisters, be it known that we are dependent upon God. He gives us all that we have. Matthew 6, 31, our daily bread. Forgiveness of sins, Matthew chapter 6, verse 12. He gives us a way of escape, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. You know that passage very well. There hath no temptation taken us, but such as is common unto man. But God is faithful and will not suffer, will not allow you to be tempted beyond that which you are able, but with the temptation will make a way that you may escape, that you may be able to bear it. You and I are dependent upon God for a way of escape. And in these days in which we live, we are in the middle of trials and temptations. And we need God that we might escape. We need God in life and 
in death. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 14, verses 7 and 8, no man lives to himself, and no man dies to himself. But whether we live, we live unto the Lord. And whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. You and I are dependent upon Christ. We're dependent upon truth. We're dependent upon the Holy Spirit. We're dependent upon one another. And yes, we are dependent upon God. If you've never become a Christian, accept that truth that I described today, the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hear it, believe it, repent of your sins, confess your belief in him, and be baptized today for the remission of your sins. We would like to emphasize that you can contact our elders, and we would like to ask you first consider our prayer email, prayer underscore request at traderlane.org. And our elders will see that email and they will contact you personally and have the necessary discussion with you and assist you in whatever way. Also, our phone prayer line is available. That line will have a number of people on it at the same time. Uh, that number you may see and the access code. If you've never obeyed the gospel, we invite you to do so. We've had people baptized while we are in this pandemic, while we have suspended services, and you can do the same. You're not independent. You are dependent upon Christ for your salvation. And those of you today who are members of the church who have a request for prayer, perhaps it's for forgiveness of sin, who have a request for prayer because of circumstance in your life, contact us on that prayer line, and may God be with you until we meet again. Show me the
and reminding of us of our dependence on God and our interdependence on one another. We are blessed to be able to have uh, God to rely on to know that he is uh, there with us. Uh, in closing, I'd like to read a scripture from Romans chapter 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's go to our Father in prayer. Our God, this has been a wonderful day. This has been a wonderful time to think about you, to be reminded of your power and your grace and your love and your commitment to us. And we thank you so much for being our Father and for allowing us to be your children. God, we pray for all of our members all over the uh, city and all over the state that you would bless them and help them with whatever difficulties, trials, or struggles they may be contending with. Father, we thank you so much for your presence in their lives, and we pray that we would all be able to uh, care for one another and support one another in this uh, difficult time. Father, we thank you so much for all of the wonderful ways that you have answered our prayers, for those that you have healed, for those that you have helped, for those that you have allowed to uh, come to grips with the grief that they are dealing with in their lives. Amen. Father, we pray that you would continue to be with us and guide us and direct us, uh, particularly in these uncertain times, that we would always know that you are our Father, that you are our God, and that we can depend on you. We love you, we praise you, and we thank you in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. God be with you, oh God be with you, God be with you, uh -huh. until we Yeah.